It's the most valuable sports league in the world. But America's National Football League has had a share of controversies recently that it certainly would prefer to put behind it. Marianne Turk is Chief Operating Officer of the NFL, and she joins us now on the staying power of arguably the most powerful sports brand going. Thanks for making some time for Thank us. Thank you. Glad to be here. I, I'm sorry about how predictable this first question is going to be, but we're TVO, and you're from Kingston, Ontario. I am. And I want to know how the heck somebody comes from Kingston, Ontario, and ah. becomes COO of the biggest, richest sports league in the world. It's a torturous path. <laughs> I don't think it was, actually. <laughs> no, you know, it's... Um, I don't know. It, it, it all... Everything kind of comes together, right, in a, in a career. And a, a lot of young people say that ask me the same question. How did you get to where you are? And really, um, every step of the way, I just did what I thought would be fun, and I tried to do my best at it. So I started with engineering at Queen's. You're a Queen's, uh, Queen's University engineering grad. That's exactly right, yep. And so then, you worked uh, for the Ministry of Transportation in Ontario yes, for a while doing yes, bridges was, and roads. And, that's right, when, when the 416 was four-laned from uh, the 401 Ontario. up to Ottawa, we were part of that. Uh, <laughs> Part of that project. And how exactly does, does designing roads and bridges and highways prepare you to be the chief operating officer of the of sports league? Well, fighting fires, right, in, in the field, maybe I could say that, but also I, I went back and did my master's in business administration. So I really switched gears there and um, did, I worked at a global consultancy house after I finished my MBA. And then one thing led to another through my network and I ended up um, working at, at Bell Canada. And while I was working there for George Cope, I, uh, he gave me the great opportunity to sit on the board of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, at which time, if you recall, we hired Tim Lewicki from mm -hmm. Los Angeles. Yep. At the same time, a, couple of year, a year after that, his brother was named COO of the National Football League, Todd. You replaced him. Well, yes, because he went to Seattle to uh, start the NHL, the hopeful NHL uh, expansion franchise out in Seattle. So, and he's he was uh, president of the Seattle Seahawks for a long time. So he's a great community guy out there, and he's looking forward to going back to Seattle to do that. So that's kind of how it happened. That's how it happened. Uh, again, uh, you know, I feel in some respects like I've got to apologize for these questions because they are so predictable. But I think our viewers are interested. You are probably the highest ranking woman in the world when it comes to pro sports. Does that, is that important to you? Uh, no, not really. Um, if it had been, I think I would have been a lot more out there with it. I mean, it's, it's an important job in sports and I happen to be a woman doing it. And um, I always say that, you know, the more ordinary that is, the better it is for all the young girls and young women coming uh, behind me, hopefully. So, you know, you just got to do your job every day and stick to it. Okay. You gave a speech at the Canadian Club about, about the resiliency of the NFL. And I found that word interesting because the NFL, I mean, the NFL is clearly the, the dominant sports league. Mm -hmm. I mean, if not in the whole world, certainly in North America. Uh, what's your annual revenue? Like 14 billion or something like that? Around. Around. Okay. So what exactly does the NFL need to be resilient from, given that it seems to be just growing all the time? I think that if you don't train to be resilient, you're going to end up in a place that you didn't expect yourself to be in. So you're going to be worse off. So I think, you know, and it comes from uh, Commissioner Goodell around, you know, enough is never enough. Like, are we, yes, the narrative is good right now, but what, what's the next narrative? Where are we going from here? And I think if you're not, if you don't train yourself to be disciplined and to be resilient, you get surprised. And we have been training, my observation is that it's a very resilient organization, and we've come out this year with a better product on the field, with a positive narrative, with more people viewing, and, you know, define gravity on ratings and viewership. So I think that it's... Um... Well, let me push back on that a bit, because, mm -hmm. of course, you did have a few years where the ratings went down. Mm -hmm. and, and, yes, they seem to have picked up, but you signed, I think the NFL signed, let me get the number here, a $3.3 billion five-year deal for, with Fox... This is just for the Thursday night games, right? Right. This is Thursday night. Not all day Sunday, where most people are watching, or even Monday or Sunday night. This is Thursday night, the least, you know, watched game, I guess, of the week. But and that was better. But that was a 33% increase in money over what the previous rights holders paid. And, like, I need to get my head around this. How, why does anybody want to pay a third more for a property that's like the worst property you guys have where the ratings have been soft. 
I don't think it's a worse property we've had. I'm going to push back on you a okay. little bit there. I think some of the matchups on Thursday night have been amazing. But let me answer it a little bit in a glib fashion. We are 19, season to date, we're 19 of the top 20 shows on primetime television. You know what number 17 is? Game five of the World Series. Which was so a fantastic game. So sports really matters in broadcast television. The Thursday night football package in the States prior to when we just renewed was shared between CBS and NBC. Mm -hmm. Fox really wanted it all. It's must have content in terms of how you sell advertising in the broadcast universe. And it's worth a lot when you have, it's about relative importance <laughs> of content in broadcast television and on a relative basis, we're still the most important. Why do you think, I mean, viewership did dip for a few years. Why do you think that happened? I think it was the first part of you know, people, um, you know, what you hear, the cord cutting, video on demand. I mean, I think that really it is a, and HBO will tell you this too, and I did a lot of work with HBO when I was head of Bell Media. It's a golden age of choice for video mm -hmm. content, right? So really what we had to do was buckle down and double up on the product that we're putting on the field. Because if you think about it, if it's, if it's a 30 point blowout at halftime, there's a lot of other things I can watch on TV, like that next episode of Game of Thrones or whatever it happens to be, right? So I think that for us, it was about putting a product on the field where, you know, more points are being scored, the competitive uh, differential is smaller, and you're selling hope at the end of every quarter, and, you know, it's just it's a faster game, and all these kinds of things that we work on every year is what's really helped us. And it was a cumulative, like, we've been doing that every year. I think we came through that period of the initial people who are going to opt out of cable bundles and things like that. Mm -hmm. Avid viewers, though, are going to find a way to watch, right? And we've also got, um, our, like, we're up two or 300% on our digital viewing, but it's still two to 3% of total viewership. It's so a very not modest huge. amount, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly, right? So people still want to watch their team on that whatever, 60-inch, whatever screen. Big screen is screen. possible. Exactly. So We've got a movie theater the, across uh, the road here where people show NFL games on movie screens. Yeah. And people pay, I don't know what, 10, 15 bucks to come watch exactly. an NFL game on a Sunday afternoon on a movie theater screen. Yeah, so I think it's consistent hmm. eye to the product. And then with the industry, um, the initial kind of cord cutters out, and now we're hmm. seeing that lit. You know, the, the, what's, what's uh, fascinating about the NFL is it's so big in America that any time it burps, the ramifications are massive. And you know what I'm getting to next. You know, Colin Kaepernick, who uh, you know, was a very good quarterback back in the day but hasn't played in a long time, uh, I guess because for a number of reasons, uh, well, some people think the NFL owners are blackballing him. Other people think, you know, he's just not good enough anymore and so he hasn't got a job. But he took the knee during a national anthem a while back in order to protest what he saw as civil rights problems in the United States and racial injustice. What is the, what's your view on the advisability of his doing that and all of what it has begat? Well, hindsight's 2020. Um, I really think that the work that has ended up being done in these underserved communities, which a lot of these young men, not just Colin, uh, or sort of bringing to the forefront um, is unbelievable. And it's really unbelievable because I was shown a whole world that I actually didn't know existed and I didn't know what was going on in these communities. I didn't understand the problems until I started sitting down and talking about it. And there were so many conversations with the commissioner and the players, the players formed a players coalition. Um, and now, we are spending money and resources and time at the ownership level, at the league level, and we're we're making real change. It's not just lip service, right? I mean, it's it's a proud moment. Some of the things that are happening and legislation is getting entered into various states to um, for everything from juvenile incarceration rates to other things that other teams are doing. And I think looking back now at the impact that, as you said, only because of the size and scale of the NFL that you can have. I think it's 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 good. It's really well, good. You say it's good, but you know that the president went nuts on Twitter as a result of Colin Kaepernick's taking the knee. And, of course, that led to many other players taking the knee as well. And a new policy by the NFL that if you want to protest, do it in the locker room before, before the game. Don't take the knee during the national anthem in front of the whole crowd. What did you think when President Trump decided to go on Twitter and demonize basically the entire NFL? 
I thought it's really interesting to be a brand that the Truffin president will take the time to, mm -hmm. you know, tweet about. He's got a lot of important things on his plate. Um, and for us, it was what it was. We were resilient. And I think the commissioner said a couple of times, you know, we stand by our players. There was a policy that was put in place. We had numerous conversations with the NFLPA. And as you know, the um, sort of the, the policy has been suspended now in terms of let's just work through it because the NFLPA, the Players Coalition and the league are coming together to really make the change that everybody wants to see. And football is back. The narrative is back on football. And things are good. I mean, if you look at the good that's being done in the communities as a result of the moguls we skied through last year, mm -hmm. let's say, and where football is today, I don't think we, we could have hoped for better intro to this season. I well, really it, don't. It, it did come up a little bit during the Texas Senate campaign. Beto O'Rourke, who was the Democratic mm -hmm. co candidate for the Senate there, almost won, came within a few points of Ted Cruz, uh, was asked uh, if he thought the NFL players taking the knee was disrespectful. And let's just play a little bit of what he had to say about that. Sheldon, okay. if you would. Peaceful, nonviolent protests, including taking a knee at a football game to point out that black men, unarmed, black teenagers, unarmed, and black children, unarmed, are being killed at a frightening level right now, including by members of law enforcement, without accountability and without justice. And so nonviolently, peacefully, while the eyes of this country are watching these games, they take a knee to bring our attention and our focus to this problem to ensure that we fix it. That is why they are doing it. And I can think of nothing more American than to peacefully stand up or take a knee for your rights anytime, anywhere, any place. Now, of course, Donald Trump said he can think of nothing more un-American than refusing to stand up for the national anthem. Beto O'Rourke says, I can think of nothing more American than to peacefully protest. Where are you on this? Therein lies the divide that yeah. we uh, worked through last year in our fan base. We have 180 million fans. It broadly mirrors the census of America. And that was what we went through last year. For me, it really, um, I learned a lot about the definition of what a patriot is. Um, and a patriot is someone who wants to make their country better. There was nothing unpatriotic. And that's where we really stood with our players. This is not, not patriotic. They, this is wanting to make the country better. We can talk about all sorts of other things, but at the end of the day, these guys are patriots and they really want to make this country better, something that has plagued the country for a long, long time and is still a really big problem for a lot of people, particularly a lot of people that play our sport. Anybody at NFL headquarters say, Marianne, you're Canadian. You don't understand the seriousness of this issue. That ever come up? No. No, because no. I, I took my place, right? I mean, I had a lot of learning to do and it was, to be honest, some of the, apart from learning about football, which I've loved for a long, long time, um, you know, we learn a lot about American history up here in our great school system. Mm -hmm. um, being down there and, and living there and, and working and living with people who, you know, are in it every day, I'm learning a lot. And it really was fascinating for me as, as an individual to, and part of learning about the history. Next year, the Super Bowl's in Atlanta. It's the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination. Mm -hmm. It's the birthplace of civil rights movement. There's a huge hip hop community down there. Then, you know, it's ground zero for a lot of it. And I'm learning about all of it and the importance and the relevance of that to an event like the Super Bowl. It's just, it's great. Let me raise the issue that is uh, maybe the thorniest uh, on both sides of the border as it relates to football nowadays. Do you agree that playing football the way the game is meant to be played will give you brain damage? What's the way the game is meant to be played? Well, that's a good follow-up. Um, let's just say the way the game has been played over the last half century, not with the new rules in place, because I understand there have been some, mm -hmm. some new rules in place as it relates to tackling and protecting quarterbacks and right. so on, but basically the way the game has been played for the last half century, will that get you brain damage? I think the evidence isn't clear one way or the other on that. I think what the NFL has done is they've chosen to make the game better through rule changes, which simultaneously make the game safer. And it's not just the recent helmet to helmet rule or kickoff rule or any of that, but over time, the concussion protocol, all these kinds of things are now building up on each other. On each other. 
The interesting thing too that I've learned since coming, we have a partnership with USA Football and we do a lot of work in the youth football space in America, including this um, program that was launched a few years ago called Heads Up Football. We have coaching certification that we do. So right from ground zero, how to properly play the game, how to head up, hands out tackling, all those kinds of things that help a player uh, be more safe on the field. And we've invested a lot of money in research. And it's kind of, you know, I told you I'm an engineer, right? We were just learning about it last week. Um, the engineering, the civil engineering, structural engineering, material engineering that goes into helmet design these days is fascinating. And we believe that we're in a position using advanced analytics and final element methods and other modeling techniques to design one of the most advanced helmets ever. And when I think about that, I think, yeah, great for football, but you know what? Great for every five-year-old kid that gets on a bike. Sure. And here we are, right? And we're making, we're making a difference. The game is getting safer and you, the players will be safer. That makes a difference for everybody starting today and going forward. But of course, everybody who's played the game up until now, you know, nobody in a position of authority, either in the Canadian Football League or the American Football League, will, I, I guess, acknowledge what many scientists are saying, which is there is a direct link between playing football and CTE. And do, do you think that connection does not exist? The reason why nobody's saying anything is because for every um, piece of research that's done saying positive link, there are other researchers saying not so sure and not so true, and how is that sample size taken? So that's why there's... The research isn't definitive, and that's why we're spending so much money with, you know, sort of world-renowned researchers to understand what will really make a difference going forward in the future. Okay, let's talk about the... Uh, there are millions of NFL fans in Canada. Twelve and growing. Twelve million. Okay, a third of the country. Does the NFL want to expand into Canada? The NFL wants to expand fandom globally. And it is unclear whether you need a team in a market to do that. My own view is that there's a lot of work. It's a really well-balanced league right now. We've got to, uh, we have a number of teams relocating right now that's really important for that to be successful. And we're focused on that and all signs are good there. For us in Canada, it's really about driving fandom. And one of the ways we do that is through our broadcast partners. So, so we, um, consolidated all of our content with the Bell Media family, both CTV and TSN, and they're using in-house production and other integration to really acquire fans from on the edge, right? Outside of avidity, uh, women, other folks that, you know, are new Canadians, things like that through the social, through Marilyn Dennis being a huge Pittsburgh Steelers fan. She does an amazing job. So right now the focus is on acquiring fans. In the UK, the same thing. They don't have the same um, level of fandom uh, penetration, I would say, in the mm -hmm. population that we do here. But that game at Wembley sells out every year. That's right. Yeah. It sells out, and there are four of them, and it really generates discussion and fandom mm -hmm. in the UK. The other thing that is important to the NFL is we believe, and it's been proven by other leagues, that having players from other countries uh, really propagates fandom in those countries. So mm -hmm. we've, um, we're having interesting little kind of combine skills, combine... Uh, competitions in Australia and other places where rugby is very popular, where you've got kind of the right um, physical makeup and athletic capability, but they've just never played American style football. Mm. So we go to those markets and every once in a while you pick up someone that's kind of interesting, like a Jordan Mialta who got uh, drafted to the Eagles this year, who the first time he played tackle football, I think was a year and a half ago or something down in Florida at the boot camp style thing that mm. we put them through. So those are all the exciting things that we're doing to Okay, can I lay them. can I lay a little Canadian guilt trip on you here? If the effect of the NFL expanding to Canada, and admittedly we don't know if that's ever going to mm -hmm. happen, but if that were to happen, uh, or even if it doesn't, even if the NFL just continues to get more and more popular in Canada, if the effect of that was to harm or damage the Canadian Football League, which has been around for only almost 150 years, mm -hmm. uh, would you want that on your resume? Look, I don't think the Canadian Football League is going anywhere in this country. I think that you see that with the avid fans they have across the country in the West. Um, it's a different game. Um, in some cases, it's a lot more exciting, right? A lot more high-risk offense and things like that. And we work uh, alongside the CFL on a lot of issues, and Randy and I talk about uh, a lot of them, player health and safety being one of them. Randy Ambrosi, the yeah, commissioner right, of and, the CFL. Uh, officiating being another one. So there's lots of good discussions that happen and we don't, 
feel that, uh, you know, if someone's going to destroy somebody else. We, we both survived in this ecosystem together. There are CFL fans. There are a lot of Canadians who go see Buffalo every weekend, too, you know. So I think that it's a, it's a pretty good relationship. In conclusion, what is your favorite football team in the Canadian Football League? Toronto Argonauts. Really? Yeah. And I liked you so much up until now. Come on. You're talking to a Hamiltonian here. Local team. That's okay. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> Marianne Turk, we're really glad you could spend some time with us here at TVO Thanks tonight. Thanks so much. You're the Chief Operating Officer for the National Football League. And you're from Kingston, Ontario. How about that? Thank, <laughs> Thank you very you. much. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.